everyone. Uh, I'm going to give you the lectures of today. So it will be about thermodynamic costs of uh, measurement and erasure, and it will be split in three small, I mean, three uh, sections. So first, I will very briefly go to like um, second law of information and just so give you the general picture of like uh, the two ways we're trying to follow to incorporate information in the second law. Then I will um, tell you about memories and how we can take into account memory in a thermodynamic sense. And last, um, I will explain to you uh, what measurement and erasure um, do when we try to deal with uh, the second law uh, in the context of, uh, of measurement. So, My computer is a class. So basically, what we have, um, uh, we, if we don't have information, so if we just have a physical system, uh, the second law in terms of free energy will be, will be that uh, the work you will do on your system will be greater than the change of free energy of your system. So this is basically like the second law in terms of free energy without information. Then what you saw is that actually, um, if we incorporate information, so we don't care about how it is physically done or anything. We just say, OK, now we have a physical system. I have some information about it. Can I do something better than that? And indeed, I mean, as uh, you've seen with Juan before, now what we have is that um, the work you will have to, to do on your system to change this free energy will be the same, plus this additional term in which here you have the mutual information that you gain from the measurements. So this is one first way to to, okay, this is a way to change, uh, basically, the second law by taking into account information in it. So, um, uh, yes, so here information is really, uh, I mean, this mutual information is really, uh, it has the meaning of the information we acquire on the system and that we can use to uh, maybe extract work in this case when we, when we change like, uh, the, the state of the system. So a second way to deal with it now would be to apply the second law, but this time not only to the system. So here this was uh, if we still have like just a system interacting with the bus. But, uh, and we were taking information into account as if it was only like known by an external observer. Now what we can do is to have like the system still, the bus, but now we have like, we add an additional system which will be the memory. Uh, so basically, this is the state of the demon, if you want, or the, or the state of memory. In this case, it's more or less equivalent. And now we say, okay, we want to apply the second law to this whole system. Okay? So this is what we're uh, we are going to do now, basically. So first, uh, to be able to do that, uh, I will tell you more about memories in the context of... Yes? Between this uh, way of viewing things in this way? Yeah, yeah. So in this case here, uh, we don't think of the, of the demon as a physical system. We just think of the demon as just an agent which has information. But we don't think of information so much um, I mean, attached to a physical system. We just say we have a system. It's interacting with a bus. And in order to change this free energy by this, this amount, I mean, we will have to um, give it some work that will be greater or equal to this change of uh, free energy minus this, because now we have some information. So we don't have to pay as much, basically, because we can use the information we have on the system. This is the first case. This is the, yeah, this is the first case, I mean, the first way, basically, to incorporate uh, information in the second law. But another way would be to take like, the system by incorporating with the demon, so the memory, in, inside. And now we can apply the second law, like the original, the standard second law, to this full system with the three quantity. I'm just trying to obtain my slides. So if I... If I quickly open my slides again, sorry. OK. 
okay, so this was just, so these are the quantity. So uh, here, just because uh, I always fear that, that it could be misleading to have like an H, I mean, even if it's not like the same uh, typology, but so here I'm calling the, the Shannon entropy with an S. So, I mean, it just changes like uh, the, the Boltzmann constant KB, but it's just not to, to mistake like the, I mean, the entropy with, uh, um, with the Hamiltonian, with the energy. So this was just like a recap of the definition. This is just what I was telling you about, that uh, to incorporate information in the second law, either we can, um, so either we can, uh, I mean, do, uh, have a new version of the second law and incorporate it that way, or, uh, I mean, we can apply the original second law to the full system of uh, system bus and memory this time. So this is where we were. So now, yes. Yes. Um, is there a quantity exchange between system and memory, which is heat, uh, uh, with like a heat between system and bus? You mean, can they exchange heat, the system and the memory? Uh, it is, no, it doesn't have to be. It, it can also be work. I mean, this, uh, these are going to be two systems interacting. If you're interacting with a bus, then the energy you will exchange will, will be only heat. But if you're interacting with a physical system like the memory, for instance, what you can exchange between the system and the memory, it can be heat or it can be work. It can be anything. Does it answer your question? So now, how can we think of memory uh, in the thermodynamical sense? So basically, what is a memory? So a memory, it is a physical system that can adopt like a, a certain number of meso or, or macroscopic state and stay in these states for a relatively long period of time. So I mean, be, because this is what we want when we, do, when we have a memory, we want to be able to store information and this information, it shouldn't be like just the equilibrium of your system. Otherwise, I mean, it's, it's not very useful. What you want is that you will have some information here that, is, uh, that will remain like that for a long time, so you can trust your memory, but that is not like uh, the global equilibrium. So it is only the local equilibrium. In this, for instance, in this double well potential, it, your uh, encoding the zero will be being in the equilibrium only with respect to this harmonic potential, but not with respect to the full damping potential. So that is like um, the way we can implement a memory, let's say. So this implies an ergodicity breaking because it means that you're going to remain in this uh, part of the phase space for long enough that, uh, I mean, you can make use of this memory. So if I represent it uh, in phase space here, what you have is that you're going to split the full phase space in different regions, and each of these regions are going to encode for one given uh, informational state. So what is an informational state? An informational state is a non-equilibrium state, but that is in local equilibrium, and that can depend on history and our, or on our knowledge. So for instance, if we have a full phase space, we can say, imagine just a physical phase space. So we can, we can have a dumping potential, for instance, and, uh, and say, okay, this right side of the potential is going to be, to encode like the position left. This left side is going, uh, this right side is going to encode the position right. So I have two informational states, even though I have all the discrete position available. But I'm just like uh, um, using all this phase space to obtain different informational states. So in this example here, my informational state will be these four possibilities. So to each informational state, I can associate a given probability. But I mean, we should remember that this informational state, inside of them, so they are made of many different microstates. So if we look at the partition function for a given informational state, so for instance, I say my memory is in zero. So the partition function of uh, your memory in the state zero would be this, uh, if you put m equal to zero, of course. And then the free energy associated also to one given uh, um, informational state, uh, we just have this definition. Yes? Yeah, so uh, an informational state is the way in which the phase space is partitioned, like the shape of the partition? 
Yes, basically, I mean, uh, an informational state is one, uh, so you have your face space, you divide it into ways that seem natural to you and also that can lead to like local equilibrium. And then in this division, you will obtain a certain number of informational states. So the, the informational state is the, the minimum of the itself or the, the state of the potential that you define? Uh, it, it is the ensemble of, um, of uh, phase space states. Well, it is, so basically an informational state will be, for instance, this region. Uh, and this region will be associated to the state M, which can be one, for instance, or zero. I mean, you can call it whatever you want. But all this is going to be associated to the same quantities that we're going to play on with the memory. Does it uh, answer you? Yes? So each micro state, uh, actually, you are gathering um, possible micro states with, with your finger, possible states. So I have, an, I have an ensemble of micro states, and I'm I'm gathering some of them together to build the, like an information null state, some, uh, another like, set of, of um, this microstate together to have another informational state. So I'm splitting my full ensemble. I'm splitting it uh, this way to obtain, in this case, four uh, informational states. Yes. If you compute this partition function, it seems more like inside each informational state, you are interested in the particular microstate. So what, what do you want to do exactly? So, so what we want to do is to, from the full phase space, to obtain our, um, our informational state. But then when we derive the partition function of a given, a specific informational state, then we have to, to integrate over all the possibilities that are inside of this phase space region. We, we are, we are. I mean, we are interested in this probability here. And this is what is going to be our memory, basically. So the, the probability would be GM over G of all phase space. Like GM over the volume of all the phase space. Uh, like this. You mean this probability PM? Yeah. So, so I mean, it, it depends because it, it, um, so it depends if this is in equilibrium or not, basically. Because, it, yeah, it doesn't have to. Okay. So this is actually... Yes, so, so, I mean, we can write like the informational state of the memory just like that. So you will have just like some given probability to be in each of the possible uh, informational state for the memory. And you can also write it in terms of phase space, which will be something like that. If your microstate is in this uh, phase space region associated to your specific informational state. And then what is important, maybe it will answer what you are just saying, is that, uh, for instance, if we take this example, here uh, we have that the probability to be in each of these informational states matches well the equilibrium probability. But if I suddenly change the potential, then here I will not change uh, my distribution, but the equilibrium probability will be changed, you see. So here my informational state will be, I have a probability still one half to be here, one half to be here, but it doesn't correspond to uh, the phase space volume uh, associated to, to each of these two states. You see? So for, for these two situations here and here, and here it is a typical example, here you can think this is like a memory in which you are in the state one, for instance, but one is not like uh, the most, uh, I mean, this is not the, the state that you would end up with, with your memory if you wait for an infinite amount of time with this, uh, with this potential. So this is why, I mean, this informational state, they need to be, to be living long enough that we can do something with the memory. Yes. So I didn't understand. Within one, one information state, that F1 local information state is assumed to be in the equilibrium? So, so we cannot have the informational state is a global equilibrium. So it's not a global equilibrium, but it's only a local equilibrium. 
This is why, for instance, if I have a potential like that, you see, it would be a very bad idea, and I actually, it, it, it doesn't suit the definition, if I say that, for instance, if I have this potential and I say, all this region will be associated to like this, uh, the, uh, the one, and all, only this half will be associated to zero. This would not be good. It will not be like a too good informational state, because actually, if I prepare the one, for instance, so I will have like a probability to be in this region here, but very, very quickly, it will, it will go in also in this zero um, region. So, I mean, my, my memory, I, I cannot use it. Uh, immediately, I will lose the information, if you want. Does this answer your question? So, it's not a, a global equilibrium state. Um, there is equilibrium. I mean, yeah, there is a local equilibrium, if this is what you want to say. Yes, in, 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 if you look only at, like, for instance, this harmonic potential, so if you forget about the full potential, then here, yes, you can be in equilibrium, yes. Yes, yes. 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 If it is an information, yes. if it is a memory, then I know that it will stay there long enough so that I consider yes. it. Uh, that is right? Yes, and I mean, this is what you want, because you want exactly a memory that depends on what you told him before, because you wanted to remember something, uh, some information. So they need to compute like kind of a transfer uh, probability uh, with P, X, and P, N. Mm -hmm. Well, you can, but basically what you want is that it will stay where you put it as long as possible. Okay. But yes, you can compute like how much time it will take to go f from this place here to, to full, uh, I mean, to go to the whole potential, but this should be long. I mean, you want to, to have enough time to use the memory to do something useful. Yes, I mean, you can even think, for instance, of the Zillard engine. So you can think that you have like a physical uh, space, and that, uh, so here, uh, I mean, I have all the positions that are available, and then I just insert a barrier anywhere. But now that I have this barrier, then I can say that this is like the informational state. So this is, for instance, n equals zero, and this will be n equal one. And because there is this barrier, I mean, once you have like particle trapped in one or the two positions, as long as the barrier is high enough, then, I mean, uh, you're safe. You can treat this as a memory. But then you see all these microstates of like the individual positions here are mapped into just like a single informational state. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I know it's something with DNA. In DNA, you have one A, let's say, in one side of the DNA. And what is the barrier? The barrier should be the, I mean, what is to switch from A to D or to C or to D to detach and then take from the bar Actually, this is for memory, but also any information device, like a, I don't know, a computer or something like that. If a computer yeah. works directly with it, it's not the case. It's not only to store, but also to... To manipulate. To manipulate. Yeah. You can, with the barriers and so on, you can implement logical gates, for instance, or things like that. Mm -hmm. So this is the most general case that you have a information state, which is given by the probability. Yes. Thank you. Okay, is this, uh, is this clear so far? So now, so what is the non-equilibrium free energy of a memory? So basically, uh, the way to, to calculate this is to say that actually you will have, you can split this uh, non-equilibrium free energy of your memory into these two parts. So you have like the free energy associated to each of the informational states plus, well, enfin, well, minus k t, well, but the k is inside of this entropy. Uh, so minus this term here, which is related to the informational entropy. So this, for instance, if I have, um, if I have two informational states, just uh, one and zero, 
it will just be like the uh, P0, well, minus P0, ln of P0, minus P1, ln of P1. So this is just information related to the informational states themselves. And this can be proved. Yeah, this can be. Yes, uh, yes, I wanted to. This, I mean, we can start from uh, so the definition. So we have uh, the free, so the non-equilibrium free energy of your memory that you can write as a sum over all these microstates of like, this is the energy of a specific one plus kT of ln of the probability of a specific one. times the probability, like that. And then uh, what you can do is to, um, uh, yes, is to use the definition I gave you before. So here, you have the definition for the, the phase space state of the memory. So we have this P of x. We can put it back uh, in here. So what we are going to have is of this x plus kT, ln of Pm minus kT, ln of Pm minus well, kT deep h of x dx. Then this and that they are going to cancel each other. And then then here you see that I will not have anything that depends on x anymore. So this will, so I can split the full space phase space into like the phase space region associated to each of the informational states. So then I will have a sum over all the informational states, integrating over only the region associated to this specific informational state of, so PM, KT, LN of PM, minus kt ln of zn plus f. And then this is just so I can bring things together. So here, this with this will give me the average of my uh, free energy for each informational state plus this. So this is what is going to be there, and this is what is going to be there. Okay. Now uh, we can think of what happens if we have a symmetric memory. So for instance, uh, in the case of the Dunfing potential, so a symmetric memory would be if we have something like that. Well, well. So this, for instance, would be a symmetric memory. So if we have a symmetric memory, what is going to happen is that we're going to have, so for a symmetric memory, Then we're going to have that the fm are all the same and there are some quantity f. And, uh, and of course, yes, the pm are just like, but this I don't even need it actually. So then what it gives is that, um, well, that the change of free energy will just be kt of uh, the entropy of my memory initially minus the entropy of my memory after the operation. So this is only in the case of a symmetric memory. And what is interesting, so here you see that if you go from um, so this was going from an initial memory in the state M to a memory in the state M prime. So 
if I'm um, if I'm restoring the memory to its uh, initial state, so I'm, if I'm lowering the, the entropy of my memory, then it means that this will be bigger than that, and then this quantity uh, is positive. Uh, whereas if I'm using the, um, the memory to uh, do something useful on my system, so I will go from a memory that is uh, initially in a pure state, so this will be zero, and this is going to be some positive quantity. So overall, my delta f is going to be negative. I think there were a question. Yes. Uh, it means, uh, yes, if you were waiting for uh, like an infinite amount of time, yes. But you can still have a, a, a symmetric memory in which you prepare just like, uh, for instance, uh, the state zero. But it, it will stay like that for some time. It's just that uh, the phase space has the same size and, uh, for each uh, informational state. Uh, yes, well, with uh, equal size on each side, yes. In the case of the Zillard engine, this would be that. I mean, a symmetric memory for the Zillard engine would be to put the barrier in the middle. Okay, so is there any question? So this is basically the way to treat a memory. So now what we can do is to look at what happens when we do the measurements. So for this... Yes, so this, with that. So now I'm going back, I'm going to the, the point I was telling you in the beginning. So now we're trying to look at the system and the measurement apparatus together and apply to them the second law as a whole. So what you have is that you start with your system, your observer. Initially, they are uncoupled and uncorrelated. So it means that basically the free energy of uh, the system and memory is just the free energy of one plus the free energy of the other. And they're also uncorrelated. So, I mean, the, the energy itself of each of them is just an additive quantity. Then you do this measurement. So the goal of the measurement really is to correlate the two. But we don't want to change the state of your system because this is what we want to gain information about. So the system we don't touch, but we change the state of the memory according to the state of, of the system. And in doing that, what we're going to do is to create correlation between the two. And then we decouple them. So still there is no coupling term in the Hamiltonian or anything. Uh, we are uncoupled at the end of this, uh, of this uh, measurement. So what happens is that initially your probability of being in the, in the state M and X, so informational state M and state of your system X, is just the product of uh, the individual probabilities because they are uncorrelated. As I was telling you, the, uh, the energy is just additive. Same for uh, the entropy here, because there are no correlation. And then, as a result, the free energy is just also additive in this case. But once uh, we do this uh, measurement, what is going to happen is that now there are going to be correlations. So you see now the probability to be in Mx is going to be the probability of your state to be in the microstate X times the conditional probability for, the, for your memory to be in M, given that your system was in X. So of course, if we have like a, an ideal measurement, this, this should be one, because you want that you have perfect correlation between the state of your memory and the state of your system. So uh, the energy are still going to be additive. This is because we decoupled the two. So I mean, there is just uh, in the Hamiltonian one term for uh, the system, one term for the memory. The, the entropy, the global entropy, in this case, it is not going to be just additive because we have here the mutual information that is going to appear. Of course, I mean, this was the goal of the measurement. It was to create this uh, mutual information between the two. And then as a result, uh, the global free energy, it is going to be the free energy of your measurement apparatus plus the free energy of your system and this additional term, which uh, is proportional to the mutual information. So here, remember that the state of the system has not changed. So here, the free energy we have there is exactly the same as we had here. The whole goal of this measurement operation was to act on the, on the memory itself, not on the system. So now, if we ask ourselves, OK, so how much work do I have to put in order to do this process, to do this measurement process? So then I just have to, to look at the, the change in the 
free energy, so the total free energy. And what is going to be is just this quantity. So we can do the, the derivation together, but it's quite simple. So the change in the free energy of, so here I'm calling the system X, of X and M, it is going to be the free energy of X and M. So uh, initially, let's say, well, the final minus the initial. This one, we said that it is the free energy of the measurement of the memory after the measurement plus the free energy of our system minus KT uh, information, mutual information between X and the memory once we have the correlation. And this was just this additive quantity of FX minus FM. So of course, this term and this term, they cancel and we we'll have the change in the free energy of the memory minus this KT mutual information between the two. Okay, so now we know, so this is, a, so be careful that this is the minimum. So here I could have put an inequality. So at least to do this operation, you will have to to give to the global system of uh, your system plus memory this amount of work. And, and here, so the mutual information, here it appears as the reduction of the entropy uh, due to the measurement. So the entropy of the system, of course. Yes? I, I don't know if you heard the first term in the equation, the first term in the equation. So this, uh, here you mean? Mm -hmm. So here, this is the free energy of system and memory, so both together, uh, the final one. Uh, so after the measurement. Yes? Uh, sorry, I don't see the difference between M and M. Okay. Prime, yes. So uh, the thing is that you start with a memory. So if everything is ideal, I mean, in a typical world, we would start with a memory, for instance, in the state zero. So M prime would be your memory in state zero. And then what we want is that the state of the memory correlates with the state of your system. So let's say your system is like uh, has probability one half to be in one and one half to be in zero. Then we want that the state of the memory was zero initially, and now it's one half with probability one half, uh, well, one with probability one half, and zero with probability one half. So this state M prime, it is the state of the memory once it's encoded information on the system. Okay. You have to think of X, M, and so on. They are random variables. Yeah? They are uh, always. Uh, state of the system, the state of the memory before, well, random, maybe as we have said, M is equal to zero before, but uh, in general, X and M are random variables, this is why they have this probability distribution and so on. And the only assumptions is that they are correlated before, and this assumption about the, the Hamiltonian. So, and why they are random variables? Because we always apply this to ensembles or, 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 or you apply this to a single system and a single demo or observer, you have to think that you have to repeat it many times. So this is, uh, at the end of the day, it's, it's, it's dealing with random variables. This is what you have done in the exercises with the Silar mm -hmm. engine, no? You have X is the state of the system, M is the outcome of the measurement, which can be a error free or can Yes, that's why we, we say with probability one half this or that, because in the end, on a single realization, then you will have x equal to, for instance, one, and then m is, equal, is going to be equal to one if we have good correlation in this way. But, uh, and and this, is, this is the, I would call this an ideal classical measurement, because uh, this is the minimal ingredient of a measurement, is that this, your apparatus is, becomes already with the system without answering the system. This is why X goes to X. Because if, if you have in quaternary, for instance, it, it comes back after and then 
Is an effect. It's not the system. You can measure without altering the system. Yes. Yes, this is a very, the, the most ideal scenario, and indeed in the classical case. Yes. In the non equilibrium free energy of the supraelectric system, it's a thermal with transformation, not with a minus sign? Uh, so uh, ah, yes, it is the, in the blackboard that I made a mistake. Yes. And I use this calligraphic to distinguish. So F. Non yeah. Okay, and yes, one more question. Uh, so you're speaking of this term? Yes, because initially they were an invariable correlation. Considering mm. the system essentially I have some kind of information, so I expect there is a reduction of input. And that is uh, in order to do this mutual information. Right? Yes. So when I say this instant reduction of input, reduction of entropy for the system or of, of the system, because when they say after the millennium, as in classical uh, with the arrows, Yes. So initially there was a system, and after the millennium, after the decoupling, there is an R system. Yes. So the entropy of these two cases, so is there a reduction of entropy? And with the reduction of entropy, we are talking about it? So, so the thing is that your system is unchanged after the measurement. So, the, so you can still say that the, the entropy of your system is the same from beginning to end. But now we have some information about it. So now if we forget somehow of the memory and we just think that we have this information, then uh, you, you can always call this like the new entropy of your system. But still, the state of the system has not changed. You see? So it's just that you, you, you gain some, uh, some information about it. So it's, it's more correct to think that the entropy of the full system, so system plus memory, has decreased because you correlated one with the other. So is there another question? OK, so now, uh, so yes, as I was telling you, this is just uh, a minimum. So uh, the, the work we will have to perform on our system and measuring apparatus will be at least equal to this quantity. So now, what, what if we look, uh, what if we include the erasure in the process? Because as, uh, I mean, as we told you before, the thing is that if we just do the measurement and that we stop there, it seems very good because now we gain some information, we can do things with it and everything. But it is not very fair because we still have to put back the state of the memory to its initial state so that you can start again, for instance. Use this memory again to do another measurement, and things like that. So, of course, once you've done the measurement, you can use this mutual information to apply some feedback loop, so to do an operation on your system conditionally on the output of your measurement, so conditionally on the state of the memory. So this would be this, this uh, step here. So this feedback doesn't affect the memory at all. You just use the state of the memory, but you don't touch at the memory. And then we need to do the erasure. So we need to take our memory state and put it back in this initial state it had at the beginning. And this, so if we look at the free energy we have here at this uh, instant in time, so here the free energy is that because, uh, I mean, if we used like, this mutual information we had to implement some feedback loop. So now our free energy is just the sum of the two quantities. And uh, in the end, still we, we have no correlation. This erasure only acts on the memory. And we obtain this free energy that is also uh, additive, that is equal to the free energy of the system, well, the same as the initial one, plus the initial uh, free energy of the memory. And see here, we are, 
it makes sense. I mean, this quantity here is the same as this one, so we just uh, went back to the initial configuration. And in doing that, so the total change of free energy, it is going to be this quantity. So it is going to be minus the free energy change of the memory. So minus because now I'm starting from the, the one we ended up after the measurements to the initial one. This is why there is this minus sign. And uh, what we can do uh, up to now is just to sum uh, the work I had to put on my system to do the measurement plus the work I had to use also to do the erasure. And if I sum these two quantity, you see that I obtain just like this KT of the mutual information. So this is basically the cost of doing this whole measurement plus erasure protocol. And it's, and it's very nice and it makes sense because this uh, quantity here is exactly the maximum amount of work I can gain by using the information I, I obtained from the measurement. So at best, I will, uh, I will have to, to give to my system this much to measure and I will be able to extract from my system also this much uh, in the best situation. And if I don't do everything right, then I can extract less. So in the end, it was that uh, useful. Is that yes? I, I don't get what is the feedback. So the feedback is that now you have a memory and a system that are correlated. So now you, you know basically the state of your system. And what you want to do is that based on this knowledge, you want to extract energy from the system. So what you can do is to say, for instance, it is the same in the Zillard engine. So the feedback in the Zillard engine, it would be to say that uh, if I in the case of the Zillard engine, you have your barrier here, your particle there. If you have like a, a very good measurement, you know that your particle is here, then the feedback would be, if my particle is on this side, um, I let this barrier move in this way, so I do this expansion, and during this expansion, I can extract work. And if the particle is on this other side, I let my, my barrier move in this side, and I extracting also uh, some amount of work. So this is the feedback. So it depends on the measurement that come, and this is uh, the step in which you can extract work from this uh, system and uh, memory global system, if you want. And, and why is the work extracted if the feedback is minus the feedback? So this is at maximum. At maximum, it, it can be this amount. So this is because. Um, it's because you start from a state that has this uh, total free energy. And then what you can do is that, you, okay, you don't want to change the free energy of your system. But uh, I mean, this we can relax this condition, you will see later. Uh, at, at least we don't want to change the state of the memory because we want to extract energy from the system itself, not from the memory. So this has to stay constant. So what can you do in order to, to lower this total uh, free energy? The only thing you can do based on this condition is to lower this term here. So I mean, I can, I can always take this part and extract it. But that like, coincides with the integral from the initial body to the final body of the degree that you get in when in the switch to that engine you were extracting. Yes, it will coincide. Yes, it's true. I mean, when we do this expansion, we allow the particle again. To well, if I say that the feedback, uh, so here this is if I just want to extract uh, work from the from the mutual information I have only, and not from the system itself. I mean. Um, I mean, okay, I agree with you, but uh, it will not change in this case because the energy is going to be the same. But, okay, in the next slide, maybe this will help. In the next slide, what I can, what I can write is that I can apply the second law only to the feedback step. 
So I am applying the, feedback, the second law only to this feedback step. So we have that the work that I have to do on my system has to be greater than the change of free energy during the feedback. And this will be equal to like the change of free energy of the system itself. So this is what you are saying also. The, free, the change of free energy of the memory, this is going to be zero. And I have this, uh, this quantity there. So uh, if I'm using all the information I have on my system, it means that at the end, this mutual information between the system. Uh, so here you see, I, I assume that I've changed the state of the system. This way you have an S prime. And so if I'm trying to extract as much as possible, this should be equal to zero. And then I will obtain that the, the work I have to perform on my system is equal to be the change of free energy of X minus this quantity. So here, I, it's, it's taken into account the fact that X can be modified. Yes. I don't understand what changes from before. We said we said we were looking at an ideal property measure when X was not changed at all, and X was not actually aggregated. It just remained X itself. What is it now? So, so during the measurement, X is not changing, never. So here, I also, X was not changing during the measurement. Here, I'm just looking at the feedback itself. No, not the erasure. It's just because here, okay, if I come back to the beginning, here we had a system and we want to incorporate information in the second law. So either we look at information as some external thing I have, or I say, okay, I have this system, so the memory plus my system, and now what I do is that I first do a physical measurement, then I use this measurement to, to, to do a feedback. So this is actually this feedback step that I want to look at. Because in the end, what I want to say is, OK, let's say I have a system. I have some information on it. So I have already done the measurement. This is what is implied. I have already done this measurement. I have some information on my system. How much work can I, uh, can I extract? Or how much work do I have to perform on my system to change its uh, free energy by uh, the given quantity, by delta F uh, of the system? So. Okay, let me write it. Sorry? Well, this is uh, what is uh, written here, yes. Because, yes, you have your system and memory. You do this measurement. And then you do this feedback. So you split them. Here, you split them. And then you do a feedback. So the feedback, indeed, it can change the state of your system like that. It doesn't change the state of the memory. And then what you want to do is that you put this back to the, to the initial state for the memory. But then, so, so this here will be the measurement. This here will be the feedback loop. And this here would be the erasure. Well, but uh, the thing is that in the previous slide, uh, it, was, um, it was written as if it was, uh, the system was not changed. Ah, yes, yes. OK, yes, yes. This is a measurement. It means that in the measurement, the system has not changed, but the measurement, the observer changes. And in the feedback, the observer doesn't change because this, this, this information. And the system changes. But it can change in the cycle, then it's private because it goes. Mm -hmm. Exactly. But, but it undergoes some process. So that it was Elias said in the measurement, the feedback would change because that means it undergoes the cycle. Yes. The other one, it changes, but it, it, it first undergoes the cycle. Yes. Yes, indeed. So in the previous example, we did then at some point to send S back to S prime back to S. Another measurement or feedback? Or? Well, you, you can, but uh, here I prefer to, to think in terms of like just uh, staying at this S prime. I mean, if you were to repeat, so if we think of this as like a, a cycle of a measurement uh, engine, for instance, then yes. But here, if you just want to apply the second law 
to uh, a system on which you have information, then what you want is just to apply the second law here. Because you want to say, okay, I'm applying the second law to a system on which I have some information, and I want to, to see during this process of the feedback, what is going to happen given that I have some information on my system. And, and I don't ask that the system at the end is like the same as initially. I'm just looking at the system on which I have information and I see how it, what can I do with it and what are the quantities that are going to be involved in the second law. This is, right, this is why I like to write it in this term because basically we're applying the second law, so the standard, the typical second law, only to the feedback part, you see. And in this one, we don't restrict anything on the state of the system. Before I was, uh, before you had X, because you can think, uh, you can apply this also to the case of a cycle. But here we can be more general. We can say, okay, what is the second law in the case in which I have information on my system? Yes. How do you decouple the two together? I mean, so. Um, so, how to explain this? So it, it will depend on the, on the physical implementation, of course. What, what you, I mean, maybe you should not think of it in this term. You should think that we have some mutual information, and this mutual information, it has a thermodynamical counterpart. So this mutual information, it's lowering the total entropy of your system plus measuring apparatus. So when you have lower entropy, you can extract work. So you know that by increasing, so by, by removing this mutual information, you can extract work. We don't have a, even need to say how you will do it, but we just need to say that, okay, you started with a, a, a total um, entropy that was to a given value, now you increase it by removing the mutual information. Because you're, you're basically, if you, remove, if, you, if you remove the mutual information, it means that you're losing the information of the, of the correlation. So when you lose information, it's as if it's as when we expand. Doing this expansion is basically losing information on where the particle is. So losing information about the correlation is also, well, something from which you can extract work. So here it is very theoretical. We just say, okay, we have this knowledge from which we know that we can theoretically extract some work. But then, I mean, uh, the way to do it would be just, for instance, if you have, um, I don't know, if you have like a, a is it simpler to think of? Yeah, if you think of the ZR engine again, if you have like the state of your particle like that, so you start from uh, so the state of um, your system and memory. After the correlation, if it's a perfect measurement, you will have one one. Well, it will be in one one zero zero. So you will have only these two possibilities. So this is the state of the system, this is the state of the memory. Now, if I do the expansion, it means that I know that my particle is on this side. My memory tells me that my particle is on this side. Now, in the feedback, I do the expansion like that. So after the feedback, my memory tells me that my particle initially was on uh, this side, but now my particle, it is like, uh, it is going to be, uh, I, I don't know how to write it, but it is going to be one with probability uh, one half plus the state zero with probability one half. So this is how my, my system has evolved because now I've done this expansion. And same, if I started with a memory telling me, oh, your particle is on this side and that I do the expansion, my memory hasn't changed, but my particle now is with equal probability on each side. So now I'm going to end up with a state in which actually I can factorize the state of, uh, so it's not very good to write it like that, but. Uh, I don't know. This is the state of the system and this is the state of the memory. So then I can just factorize and say that actually, no matter the state of the memory, my particle in the end has equal probability to be on each side. So you see in this process, this is a typical example of a feedback in which at the end, you destroy the whole correlation. There is no mutual information anymore because your memory doesn't tell you anything anymore about the state of the, the system after the expansion. Yes. Yes, yes. Yes. 
and uh, we uh, remove the uh, mutual information. Yes, yes. I mean, because this is uh, all we want in the end. Because you have a system, you have some information about it. Now, what can we do with it? I mean, the whole point of all this story was to say, OK, I want to apply the second law to a system on which I have information. So we add this first step of the measurement to say, OK, now I have information on my system. But now that I have a system and information about it, I want to see, OK, now, what can I do? I mean, what is going to be the second law in this process, given that I have some information? So th this, this feedback is actually very important because this is what we want to know about. We want to know if I have a system and information about it, how much do I have to do on my system to change its uh, free energy by uh, a quantity? So this is, uh, this is what we're interested in, basically. This is uh, what is written there, you see. I mean, basically, you can think that now applying the second law to a system on which you have information, it tells you that the, the work you have to put on your system is going to be at least as big as the change of, uh, of free energy of your system minus this quantity with the mutual information. So it is, a, let's say, another way to find like this uh, modified second law in the case of information. Does it answer your question? Okay. Yes. 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 Sorry, we are assuming what? Yes. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, 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 for sure. This is the case in which uh, it's all perfect and ideal and everything. If it's not, I mean, you will have other possibilities. But I mean, if your measurement is not like, the worst in the world, still this will be the state with the larger probabilities. You will have others, but with small probabilities. So they will contribute a little, but not so much. Is there any other question? Yes. Uh, so, okay, I should not have written it this way because it's not very good, but when I write it this way, it means uh, that x is equal to 1, m is equal to 1. Here, x is equal to 0, m is equal to 0. Here, I say that my memory state is 1, so maybe it would have been more clear to put it like that. My memory state is 1, and this is the state of the system. So this is to say that after the expansion, I have probability 1 half that my particle will be here, 1 half that my probability will be here. This is just to say that the average state of my system, basically, so the new state of my system, so is the x prime, if you want. So, well, I can say x prime. It is going to be a random variable with probability 1 half to be in 1 and 1 half to be in 0. OK? Yes, and also to, to gain work out of it. I mean, it is the most. Uh, I mean, it seems very natural to want to expand like that and to, because you can extract work cultures in this way. Indeed, it will bring us back to the initial state, but the main point was to extract work in this case. Is there any other question? Mm. So in the end, I was fast. Uh, Yes, more or less. Uh, with the, the following. OK. If there is no other question, uh, Juan is going to continue like the next uh, lesson. So. OK, look, this was rather, I mean, not, not easy, but it was um, just the application of second law that we obtain delta f work bigger than delta f. And also the fact that, maybe in the previous slide, <coughs> the fact that, no, in the previous one, no, the, the one that, uh, 
Do you want to please what? The next one. Here. The next one. Here. The fact that this is the, the, the most important thing. The fact that the entropy of two systems can be written as the entropy of each one minus The entropy, this entropy is always smaller than this one. Why? Because here you have correlations. So X contains, X is telling you things about M prime, M prime is telling you things about X. So, so and this is precisely this total information. So think, look at this. This is just this thing, just this equation. And the second law that we wrote, this is delta F, W, bigger than delta F. This is, a, any, this is enough to analyze the, the A mean and so on. And the, and the, and the and everything. So this is, this is the, the, no, take it. Uh, there was a question? Yeah, I was about to say that if you Ah, okay, sorry. Uh, well, no. Uh, what did you say? The microphone. No, thank you very much. Was great. <laughs> so and um, no, uh, no, 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 no. I wanted to say something else. Ah, yeah. Well, yeah, I wanted to say that um, this this scheme. Well, this scheme is in in the papers by Sarawa and. Uh, it's even implicit in Bennett's paper in the 1970s when, when he wrote that's a, uh, when he wrote that the cost, you remember the story, no? Uh, Maxwell wrote this in, in 1867, then Sira introduced the Sira engine in 1922. And for 50 years, there was nothing new. No, for 50 years, people thought that the, the, to, rest, to, to, to restore the second law, you need to, there, there is a cost in the measurement. Because, of course, nobody thought of erasure. I mean, who, who, who <laughs> this is very surprising, no? And, and this was in the 70s. And, um, and now we have this uh, scheme that the work the work that compensates the feedback can be here or here, and uh, and everything is ex and actually everything is explained. This is what happened in science: that things that look very attractive when when you solve it or when you understand it, then they become very kind of uh, not very. But but still, this is interesting, and uh, but uh, but look what 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 it is going on. What it is going on is that. You create a correlation that decreases the entropy and consequently increases the free energy. And then in the feedback, now you have an excess of free energy, you can exploit this. Free energy is work that you can do. So uh, the whole story of the Silar engine is that uh, there is a creation of correlations and then an exploitation, exploitation, exploitation of correlations in the feedback. And um, actually, when we wrote uh, the review for Nature Physics with Jordan Horowitz and Takahiro Sagawa, Takahiro is the one who really did this in a very form, formal way. Um, then we were discussing what is information. This actually was my reflection for the last day, but. We can tell what is information from a physical point of view or a conceptual point of view. And, um, and, uh, and I insist always that it is this, what Leah mentioned at the beginning, these states that have a long life and so on and so on. But Takahiro and Jordan are saying, no, information is correlations. And the steel engine is just to, to create correlations, the straight correlation, and this is it. This is the whole story. I don't think so. I think there is. I think there are two aspects of information. One is this one. One is that information is just, or just is is one aspect of information is that it is the correlation between two systems, and in this sense, correlation is free energy. This is the the main message. 
and then um, and then you can explain everything like, like with that. The other aspect is this long lifetime um, uh, states and so on, which I think it's also another important and crucial aspect of information. Yeah. So uh, I want to ask if we are considering one realization, like local mutual information. So would it have the same formula? So the entropy would it increase for one realization, but on average, this formula holds. That's right. Everything is for average. Oh yeah, but for local or for local the for uh, you mean one realization, it may that. Uh, By local, you mean a local, single realization? Yeah, that's it. Okay. Uh, for a single realization, we have fluctuation theorems, which unfortunately we cannot uh, explain, but you have the references, and then you can have fluctuations. You can have fluctuations in the work, in the heat, even in the information. And then there are theorems that tell you that um, you can have, of course, if, if you look at single trajectories, then you can have violations of the second law and things like that. The second law is only restored on averages. Okay. Just, uh, maybe you said it before, but an example of how this, uh, the, single re uh, the single trajectory could have the second law broken, basically. Broke? Uh, the second law could be broken, which is what you said. Broken, it's yeah. For instance, in the Brownian, you don't need to have a Maxwell Demos or anything. You, you have a Brownian particle here in the gravitational field. And, um, and then the Brownian particle can go up. Oh, okay. And if you compute the energy, the entropy change, is the entropy of the universe decrease. By, but of course, uh, um, but this uh, decrease is of order kT, uh, of order k, sorry. So you can always expect in single realizations to have uh, a decrease of entropy of order k. In the Zillard engine, if you, somebody said the first day, well, if, if you don't measure and you uh, proceed with the Zillard engine and you are lucky, sometimes you are lucky and then you, you can, even, even in what you have done with that or so on, well, not for the, opti for the optimal, but well, in the Zillard engine you can be lucky and, uh, and decrease and gain kT log 2, even for three. I mean, if you run the, the FC any like 10 times, not the original one, because in the original one, if you are wrong, you, you, you cannot compress. But in the, in the, in the one with the, with the Brownian motion, you can run this. Um, uh, well, when you are wrong, you lose. Well, you, you can you can manage to lose not so much, and then uh, even in a, even in in, a, in ten turns, turns you can um, you can uh, decrease the the entropy of the universe if you are lucky. No, the measurement creates correlations. Uh, the feedback exploits those correlations. As Leah said, the optimal feedback is when you destroy all the correlations. And the eraser doesn't have anything with correlation because the eraser only uh, affects, concerns the, the demon. So uh, the eraser is what Leah explained at the beginning, is just the change of the state of the memory from a state with a, that can take on two values, so it has an entropy one bit, to a state which only has one bit. The typical eraser, I mean the, the typical the Landauer eraser. So Landau uh, eraser has nothing to do with um, correlations. Uh, it's just uh, restoring the state of the system. Okay. So thank you, Leah. And, um, and yeah, we have uh, 15 minutes to continue. 
So what we have uh, seen so far is the basic uh, aspect of this story of the Silar engine and information and thermodynamics, uh, which is the, the explanation of the Silar engine, let's say. This is what we have done. Uh, in the last 10 years or so, the, uh, there was an attempt to, to um, interpret as uh, information machines certain um, um, molecular motors, protein motors that maybe in, in biophysics are important. In nanophysics, people are trying to, to build these motors. This is different. Um, the Silar engine is just, well, a physical system, very interesting, with an external agent. And these uh, motors uh, are, um, uh, the idea is to make motors that are autonomous, like in the cell, no? in our cell. There are a lot of motors that work with ATP. Probably you have, everybody knows what ATP and ADP. Yeah? No? Yeah. ATP is a molecule. It's the, like the fuel in, in the cell. Everything In the cell, you have a, a lot of molecules that make things. Transport, pumping ions from inside to outside, or I don't know, or uh, reading the DNA. You have the DNA and... You will have a course no, in the third week on RNA uh, to, 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 come, to read the information in DNA to RNA, you need another motor that uh, runs and reads. And uh, so all these machines use, use a fuel, and, it, and this fuel, this fuel in, the, in the cell is ATP, which is, a, is adenosine triphosphate. Well, it's the, the acronym for a molecule. And, um, and it's a fuel because like gasoline, you take it and you degrade it. In the case of gasoline, we, we burn it. In the case of ATP, it's a chemical reaction. And, and this uh, um, fuel can be used to, to perform these tasks, to move against the force, to compress DNA in a virus, for instance, or things like that. So um, in, the th in the two days, in tomorrow and, and Wednesday and Thursday, we will try to, uh, I will explain a framework that uh, is, uh, has been developed to try to interpret these molecules as information, right? these, these motors as information machines. The, when you have an autonomous uh, system, well, we will do also... Um, I want to uh, recall the, we were in, in lesson three, sorry that I ha we have to do these jumps. I explained this, uh, the mark of chains. And, uh, and uh, we explained the, 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 um, This is also good, but I mean, this, of course, the, the, the uh, utility, utility of this, um, this is useful for many of you, even if you are not going to study information and things like that. Whenever you want to model a physical system with, um, with, with discrete states, and many systems, even if they have Hamiltonian, at the end, if you want to... Uh, highlight some of the properties of a system, discrete systems are great. I mean, and, and uh, if, if, you can, if you can explain things with, with, a simp with a very simple model, that's always better than, than to have very realistic, complicated. Of course, this is good. I mean, if, and if you have a computer, you can go to uh, models with 20 parameters and everything. But if you can explain things with uh, Four states and uh, four parameters. This is this is also great. So uh, this is by definition uh, these are transition rates. Uh, 
and this is the this is the current. And we uh, uh, also explain detail balance. And this is exponential of minus beta, the energy minus the initial energy. And from this, we also um, prove that the entropy of the universe, which is the Shannon entropy, uh, in the case of a system in a bath, so, okay, so here I have a bath at temperature T that uh, creates these transitions. Uh, this is the entropy of the environment. This is the delta, uh, this is S environment. We proved that this, is, this can be written as uh, the, uh, all transitions from I to J and a kind of uh, irreversibility between the transitions times the Boltzmann constant, which was uh, pi uh, gamma ij. This is the number of jumps from i to j divided by the number of jumps from j to i. And this is, of course, bigger than zero, which is a kind of second law. So we prove the second. This is not the proof of the second law. This is just a proof that the tail balance is compatible with the second law, or that the tail balance implies the second law. So this is what we did uh, uh, on Friday, I think. And now we try to, uh, um, in, in molecular motors, well, here you can have an external agent and so on, uh, but in molecular motors you can you usually have well, I, we, we also explain the driving and the total energy production. In molecular motors, you usually have um, that the system is in contact. You can have your external agent performing some work. Remember, the work was the the work was uh, the sum of um, uh, well, uh, the work is is. Pi, Pi T, and the derivative of the energy with respect to time because the agent changes, the agent changes the, 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 the levels, no? This is, the, and this was work, whereas heat is, is the, the, the change in energy due to the evolution. And um, uh, here you have your bath. And, but you have also the fuel, and the fuel is usually cells are uh, in an environment with, uh, with um, uh, ATP, uh, and then you have here particle reservoirs. Well, remember this list of sources of non-equilibrium that I, I did first when we, when we studied um, the the detail balance. I said you can this this we prove this uh, imposing that the steady state is thermal, and then I said but once you have this you can go beyond beyond equilibrium uh, using sources of of non equilibrium. We studied three. One was driving. The second one was uh, temperature differences in the transitions or different thermal baths which we also studied in an ex explicit example. And the third one was non-equilibrium chemostats. Eh? Non-equilibrium thermostats are, for instance, two baths at different temperatures. So here you have chemostats. And when you have chemostats, uh, this means that uh, you have ATP, uh, ADP, and so on. So one transition, for instance, from A to J, can be mediated, we say, like, we use this word, can be mediated by a chemical reaction. So you can have that, uh, if this is a protein in a conformation, the protein absorbs ATP and changes the conformation by degrading the ATP to ATP, ADP. So we have, uh, you can write this as, as a chemical reaction.
And A and J can be anything, can be spatial states, like for instance, the protein motor trying to move and so on. And this can be ATP or another fuel. For instance, in some uh, chemical motors, David Lee is doing motors, and I talk about Feringa Stoddard, who won the Nobel Prize for Feringa and Stoddard in 20 something. Uh, this can be light, this can be anything. But let's put this example. So how the, the, the detail balance is modified? It's modified in this way. I have the energy. Actually, detail balance is always the free energy after minus the free energy before. Here, because we are considering micro, well, mesostate, well, actually, the real detail balance condition is with free energies, but we always neglect the entropy. Remember, free energy is E minus Ts, so we neglect this part. But you, you, we should write here, or we, we consider that the free energy is the same and doesn't change. So the only thing that changes is the energy. No? We put here A, E, J, E, I. But here, when, when I have this, this uh, exchange of particles, the, the, um, the environment does change, and uh, we have to add mu ADP minus mu ATP. And in the case of, of in the case of, um, in the case, uh, let's call this delta A, delta E, sorry, the jump in energy, and, and usually we call this delta mu. Delta mu is the chemical potential of ATP minus the chemical potential of ADP. This is positive in, in normal conditions. And then this means that even though I need an energy extracted from the fluctuations to jump from I to J, the fuel helps me, eh? because this is minus minus, this is plus. The delta mu is positive, is biasing the transition toward this up, uphill direction. And this is the basis of many motors, that uh, uh, the fuel helps to move uphill in the energy landscape, okay? And, um, of course, if mu ATP, and this is the this is the chemical potential. This is this is also interesting that when I was studying at the beginning all these motors and so on, uh, or maybe you have studied biology and you think that that ATP is, has a lot of energy. You know, this is because everybody is telling you that uh, ATP is the fuel in the cell. So my picture was that ATP has strong bones and uh, and then you break these bones and then you uh, release a lot of energy. And it's not true, the, ener the energy, because in ATP, uh, remember that mu ATP, the chemical potential is the free energy per particle. So, so is the energy of, of, a, of a molecule minus T, the entropy of a molecule. And actually, in, in, in this, this is, a, this is around 14 kT. In, in, in the human body or in the, but this is because of the pH. pH, se dice pH, no? pH. pH, um, Edgar knows more about this than me. It's because of the pH, if the pH changes, this, I mean, because um, the, the energy that is not so different. The energy of ATP min, minus the energy of ADP I don't know how much is this. this is, uh, I think it's 3 kT or something, or 4 kT. So most of the energy comes from the entropy. So this is, um, and this is, this bias is super important. For instance, many motors in biology, they, even though they, they are microscopic, so they should go backward and forward, no? because uh, you, you have the two transitions. This, remember, if, if temperature is infinity, this is one. So uh, whenever you have high temperatures, uh, if, if, if you can go from I to J, you can go from J to I, unless delta mu is super big. And, and 
14 kT is super big because 14 kT divided by kT is 14 and exponential of minus 14 is, a bit, is, is very small. And this means that uh, you can bias uh, one uh, ATP can bias things. So uh, when, you, uh, when you look in the laboratory, one of these motors, there are many experiments with motors. Usually, you only see the motors going in one direction. It's very hard to you have to push the motor. You have to increase a lot delta E to see the motor going backwards. OK, so we, uh, tomorrow we will take this. And we will repeat this calculation for uh, this detailed balance condition. And we will introduce something called the chemical work, which is an interesting. Uh, and then we will, we will have to revisit the definition of heat precisely. And we will learn a lot of motors, which is, as I said, even, if, even beyond the thermodynamics of information is useful. And then we will try to use mutual information to uh, study these motors as information motors. Thank you.